next 45 minutes is uh, uh, not a talk I do often. It certainly isn't something I usually do in 45 minutes. So we'll just kind of ramble through it and hopefully some interesting things will come out. It's about uh, performance tuning. So the challenge is to say something useful about performance tuning in 45 minutes. So I'll ramble through. Feel free to interrupt and ask. Um, my first book was about using VTune, and I'll, I'll lean on that a little bit um, the, the, as I talk about uh, performance tuning. But, <clears throat> you know, honestly, <laughs> I'm going to end up sounding really old, and I'm not very old. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, you know, the first machines I worked on, I really valued the front panels on them, which uh, some of you probably never even touched a machine. You might have seen one at a computer museum, but they'd have blinky lights and things like that. And a lot of supercomputers have had blinky lights on them over the years. And if nothing more, you could tell whether the machine was doing anything because if the lights were blinking. In fact, a lot of computers still have at least the lights on them to tell the nodes running. But um, it's hard to give that up, and we pretty much have. You can't see what's going on. You kind of get a black screen. Um, and it's really hard to see what's going on inside a machine if you don't look. Um, and yeah, I love the laughter. Yes, that sounds obvious, James. I can't tell you how often I, I just, um, when, when I work with, people on performance tuning, how often they've not really looked. Um, and so, you know, you can guess. You, you know your application, or at least you think you do. Um, and uh, so, um, so, we're all Linux users, right? So I can tell bad Microsoft jokes. Now, the, the very first Xbox had an Intel processor in it, and every ST STP that they shipped, or SDV, whatever they call it, development machine, had a copy of VTune with it. And uh, I was very proud of that. Um, and Microsoft had advanced machines. And th one day I got a call from their team, and they said, you know, we almost called you yesterday. They said, because VTune, we thought VTune was really making a mistake. It was telling us that, you know, 40% of a time when we were running our first studies, 40% of our time was being spent in the graphics driver. And that's absurd, because it's a really efficient graphics driver, and it should be you know 5% of the execution time. And they said, well, we went to look. And we thought we'd look at it a little more so we could tell you more what was wrong with VTune. <laughs> and then they said, oops. They found out what was wrong with their code. It was a little lock that was working a lot less efficiently than they thought it was, and it was screwing up. And uh, they fixed it, and suddenly it was 3% of the execution of the machine, down from 40 the day before. But what it was about, it was about surprise. They knew their code. So I always think of all these tools, and I'll make different references to tools Intel has and others have. But you know, it seems like a headache. I mean, I've got prof. What more do I need? I've got printf. What more do I need? And I'm kind of that type of programmer uh, myself. But if you're really trying to do a great job with your application, the, the tools that take a little time to learn and master that can show you what's really going on are like a flashlight in a cave. And, you know, what are you looking for? Um, I think the first thing not to be shy about, uh, while you're developing your code, use tools like this to confirm that you actually got what you were trying to code. You're trying to write an eloquent routine that, uh, an elegant routine, eloquent too perhaps, but elegant routine that, you know, has no weights or does, you know, fantastic synchronization. Have you ever actually run a tool to show you that you actually got what you were trying to do? So confirmation. But the other thing, run it for surprises. If something doesn't make sense, that may be a hint. It may be the tip of the iceberg. You know, I can't help but think of, uh, uh, the the uh, discovery of uh, penicillin. If you remember the story, is, is this poor guy trying to do experiments in petri dishes, and something kept showing up and destroying his experiments. And uh, 
it turned out to be a bread mold, and it had this uncanny way of killing off all the bacteria in the petri dishes. Well, he could have just kept washing the dishes out and get his experiments right so he didn't get the mold in them. Uh, we would be worse off for it. He, he, he got a fascination with the fact that this bread mold might be useful, and it's a little antibiotic we know as penicillin. There are so many things like that. And as I work on performance tuning, the surprises often tell me a lot about what we can do with an application. And so if you're not using these tools, I really would encourage. The other thing is, it, if it seems like a headache, your expertise will grow. Because you really, you know, you're likely to be that sort of person that wants to squeeze performance because we're working in HPC. And machines have quirks. And so you, as you trace, track down things, it'll get more and more intuitive to you. So I really encourage you to look at tools. Now, if we're looking at the Intel suite, just to name names, the, the Intel VTune, or we call it Intel VTune Amplifier these days, it's, uh, uh, this is for node level. And it can do uh, performance profiling, where do you spend time. But its real power kicks in when you use these little performance counters. So uh, starting with the Pentium, Intel put these little performance counters in the chip. And they weren't there for software developers. <laughs> Goodness, us crazy software developers, we started using them and we scared the company to death. But they, these counters were put there because the, uh, the design had five functional units in it, and the hardware designers were frightened that they wouldn't be able to debug the hardware. Um, and so they put these counters in it. But then they, um, they got so scared that people would reverse engineer that we put it in something called Appendix H, and we made people sign 10-year non-disclosure agreements and horrible things. And we spent our time lobbying them to say, no, 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 we ought to make some of these counters public. So we did with P6 and retroactively to P P, uh, Pentium, and uh, just for a reference, that means we made them completely public in about 1995 or 96, I think, so it's a while ago. And since then, we've been evolving them, and the counters have gotten better, and um, there's a lot of neat things that we put in the counters. We can have we, we, we can have more exact counters, we can have stall condition counters, we can have a lot of neat things that have really been added there only for software developers. So it's evolved a lot in the last 20 years what these counters are for. They're, they're there for software developers as well as for hardware debugging um, today, and that's really VTune. And these counters are also used by other tools, but um, my personal opinion is VTune's the best at it. Uh, at, at using these counters, but the, uh, there are other tools that can access the hardware counters as well. Then Trace Analyzer and Collector is much different. It uses an instrument at MPI to look at communication traffic. It's another thing you can get insight into is what's happening at the MPI level. Uh, and then a couple of overlooked things. The, the Intel Inspector can look for threading and memory errors. Um, you know, it's really nice to be sure that your program doesn't have potential deadlocks and race conditions in it. It's really nice to make sure it doesn't have memory leaks in it. Um, parallel programs that have these things in them are very, very difficult to debug. Um, and uh, if you can make them go away using a tool like this, you'll be better off for it rather than losing a week of your life or two weeks uh, tracking down a memory leak that you didn't think was there. Uh, and then finally, the advisor. Intel advisor is pretty new. And it can give you advice uh, about scaling and vectorization. Um, and it's worth uh, taking a look at what it tells you. But I think the real bread and butter here is VTune, because most of the debugging you'll do is uh, at the node level trying to figure out your performance. Um, now, some of your debugging should be at the cluster level, at the MPI level. And that's where Trace Analyzer and Collector comes in. Um, and I did borrow these slides, so um, I have flipped through them and tried to, I, I deleted half of them and added some of my own. Uh, you have to have a sense why you're doing performance tuning. You know, do you, what are you trying to accomplish out of it? Um, but I think for HPC, that's a pretty straightforward thing. You want to uh, increase your uh, performance of your application. Um, and you get to do this at all stages. Um, we have something at Intel when we're designing chips we call uh, design for manufacturability. And it's a shorthand for design it so we can debug it and refine it. And uh, 
when you think about designing your application and stuff, it'd be nice if you think about little probe points. Where, where could you get some metrics? Where would you look? Where, what are you expecting out of your program? Um, even if you don't actually change your code for it, do you know what you're expecting to happen? Are you expecting all your barriers to happen in a certain amount of time? Uh, are you expecting to be pretty, running pretty synchronously? Uh, or do you have an asynchronous thing? What's your expectation about wait times at locks, things like that? Have it in your head and then go look at it uh, to see if it's true. And I can't emphasize this, the concept of this slide is tops down. Don't overlook the big things. You know, I mentioned memory allocation before. But what a silly thing to have screw up your program. But experience tells me a lot of applications out there that are doing parallelism uh, have never thought about whether their memory allocator is really tuned for parallelism. They just assume it is. Uh, I can tell you they're not. Uh, TBB memory allocator. But you can, you can test these things. You can look at it. You can look at that performance directly with some of these tools. Um, you can also play a guessing game and swap in and out libraries and see which works better, which is probably the, the method most people use. But there's so many different things you can look at at this level, network and uh, uh, stuff. There's even BIOS options. I, this is a silly thing, but there, there are different um, there are different options that may or may not help your performance. Um, one of them on KNC that some of the customers use is that they turn off iCache snooping. Um, that's an option on some machines. It means that you can't write uh, self-modifying code and have it work in a compatible fashion, but since almost nobody does that anymore, uh, you can increase performance a little on some machines. There's lots of games. So you never know all the knobs that might be out there to play with. Um, but hopefully most of them are in the uh, application. But um, don't overlook the fact that the type of machine you're running on, the type of uh, how big your swap files are, the, if you use such horrible things. I know that's not normal in HPC. Page size is something you have some influence over. Huge pages can have a big benefit. They're not that hard to invoke. Uh, if you don't know what they are, you may want to look at them. Um, typical reasons you use them, though, VTune can help you with that. If you have a lot of TLB misses, uh, huge pages will be one of the things VTune will recommend that you consider. So there's a lot of different tools out there. Uh, I think uh, uh, that, that you can... Uh, refer to this. I'm going to skip forward because I really want to talk about the VTune sort of things more. So it can be uh, hotspots. So hotspots are a pretty simple concept. Um, when people talk about hotspots, they're talking about looking at the program and trying to figure out where it spends most of its time. Now this can, and it, this can be useful and it can't be. The, the hard part with hotspots sometimes is figuring out the hierarchy. So one thing VTune can show you is it can show you aggregate time and uh, local time. So you may have a function that calls three other functions, and that's all it does. And so VTune will tell you that there's no time spent in the function or a lot of time, depending on which number you look at, right? Uh, if you look at the aggregate time, it'll count the time uh, it took for each of those function calls to happen. If you look at a different number, VTune will tell you it just took like no time because all it did is enter, exit, and call some things, and you're not counting those times. Both of them can be useful. Um, you may, you know, ideally, you find hot spots in your program. If your program has a neat hierarchy call nest, then it's pretty simple. Some programs, though, have worker functions that get called a lot, and you may actually uh, find that their times being rolled up multiple places and that making them efficient is, is valuable. Uh, and you can do that. You can VTune can tell you how often functions are called, things like that. And if actual function calls happen a lot, you might want to do inlining. So there's a lot of things you can look at uh, uh, when you look at hotspots. Uh, but ultimately, you're looking for time. The misleading thing about hotspots is there's no guarantee just because I spend a lot of time somewhere that I can make it run any faster. This is the annoying thing about metrics like this. So. Um, now, similarly, cache misses. Has anybody ever spent a lot of time trying to reduce how many cache misses they got? 
nobody. Yes. Is there a danger in just trying to reduce cash misses? I've done it. The thing that really annoys me is I've gotten rid of cache misses and had my program not speed up. Because modern hardware uh, does works very hard to, to do out of order instructions, things like that. A cache miss, every time you uniquely use a data value, a data value that's never been used before, it's going to cause a cache miss. A big deal. I can't get rid of that uh, unless I stop having that data, right? And maybe that's valid. But the, the thing about cache misses is the belief that you should want to reduce them, but reducing a cache miss won't um, necessarily improve the performance of your program. So about six years ago, I think it was with the Westmere processor, we finally got the architects to include something that's called we call stall accounting. We can, um, with VTune, if you use the stall indicators, you can ask to look for some of the metrics uh, only if they caused a stall in the pipeline. So a cache miss that led to some computation being delayed. That's what a stall would be. Wow, reducing stalls will speed up your program all the time. Uh, reducing a cache miss, not so much. So if you're using a tool like this, it's valuable to understand that. And it's a little subtle because it's the same thing as hotspots. Um, finding the place my program spends the most of the time isn't as good as finding where does my program stall most of the time. So there's two types of stalls I would look for. Um, one is things with the memory hierarchy, either cache st stalls induced by caches or by TLB misses, um, and look for uh, where they're happening. And if you're lucky and you can find a section of code that's plagued with stalls, that's a prime place to look at. Can you restructure your program, rechange it, whatever. The other place to look for stalls is, is locks and synchronizations. So, and that's a different tool that you would use. The, the um, uh, VTune can do some of that and Spectre can do some of it. It can show you how long you're waiting on a lock. Uh, uh, VTune understands OpenMP. It can tell you about locks in OpenMP or TBB, um, uh, the barrier synchronizations at the end of uh, uh, parallelism uh, inside OpenMP. Uh, you get an implicit barrier synchronization looking at how long uh, waits happen for that. Ideally, all the threads hit at the same time and nobody has to wait. But if you have a lot of wait, it's probably because you have imbalances. And then trace analyzer and collector at the MPI level, looking for those. This is really prime stuff. If you're looking for things, nothing better than to find when your machine's sitting idle. And it, in my experience, it sits idle quite often due to cache memory things and it looks idle because of the barrier synchronizations. And you can see those directly with these tools. Um, so those are the things I try to shine a flashlight on. And let me see if I can uh, find a, a picture. So the hotspots are pretty straightforward. So you're looking for surprises. Um, and uh, uh, and you can, you can um, of course, one of the things you want to try to figure out, I guess, At the uh, if you're memory bound, you need to worry about um, trying to reduce your memory activity, and that this is a complicated topic. One of the problems with these tools that will always be there is they rely on our brains. That the, the tool shows you what's going on, like a flashlight. You know, it's uh, you you uh, uh, you you show, shown the flashlight. There's your it show, showed you something scary. The, the flashlight's not going to tell you what to do. You know, run, <laughs> hide. Um, VTune can't do that either. We have tools that try to give you some hints. That's the advisor tools. But they, the problem is, is, is there isn't one size fits all. So these tools really are there today, uh, and I think for a long, long time, they're there to show us as experts what's happening. And that's why it's really good to have a theory of how you wanted your program to work so that you can tell whether it's a surprise or not. If you go into using these tools and you have no idea how you wanted your program to work, the tools aren't going to tell you as much. You're better off if you think you knew how your program is going to work, and when you use the tool, you go, oh, that's not the way it's supposed to be. 
um, or, oh, it works just the way I wanted it to. Um, but the stalls are, are tough. But the memory, if your memory ba bandwidth constrained, the hard part is how do you do anything about that? Well, if you have an intelligent algorithm that suddenly needs less bandwidth, uh, maybe that's one thing. Maybe switching from 64-bit uh, integers to 32-bit integers or from 64-bit floats to 16-bit floats or something it will compact your memory and use your bandwidth more efficiently. Lay your memory out. Um, uh, are you using all the elements in every cache line that you fetch? Or are you doing a stride, f uh, you know, eight memory access so you're fetching in all these cache lines and using up your bandwidth? Th those things, the, the tools can't tell you the advice today. And I don't think they're going to anytime soon. But as an expert, you can look at these things and start to learn, like with memory bandwidth, um, it, at least know that memory bandwidth is what's limiting the performance of your application. And then and start to think through, can I change the memory bandwidth? Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of an aside, but PGAS languages have had posters at supercomputing every year, year after year, every year I've been. And it's, what, 26 years or 27 years of supercomputing now. There'll be PGAS posters again. It's the up-and-coming thing. Um, and it's easy for me to make jokes about it, but uh, the talk before I, uh, today about network fabrics, the, you know, driving latency down, the integration is going to drive latencies down. As, as the total latency, right? The latency isn't just the latency of the hardware. It's the hardware plus the software. And as the hardware integrates more, the latency will go down. And it's going to change life, and it's going to change life so that PGAS probably becomes more interesting over the next decade than it's ever been, in my opinion, because the latencies suddenly get good. So it's um, every time you see a problem, like, oh, I'm consuming too much memory, or the latency is too high, you can think about what things may what things could we do to change that? And uh, a lot of people have been thinking about PGAS languages a long time, and the, the latency, driving latencies down in fabrics are good for a lot of things, but they may be disproportionately good for PGAS. Um, memory is the same thing. It's if you can do different blocking, different algorithms, so on, that reduce your dependence on memory, it can be very helpful. Some programs speed up going to Xeon Phi from Xeon because Xeon Phi has more memory bandwidth than uh, the Xeon, more aggregate memory bandwidth. Not total, but or, I mean, it, it, not per core, but total. The, uh, so if every core is going full out, but independent data, Xeon Phi is better than a Xeon, um, and so it has better aggregate bandwidth, but on a per core basis, it has less bandwidth. So if you can scale your program so that it breaks up its memory accesses, that can be helpful. If you look at a Knight's Landing, which has a uh, high bandwidth memory on it, if you can block into that, you'll get better uh, effects because you've got a very high bandwidth thing. Same thing on a GPU. If you can um, move your stuff into a texture memory, the, you get better performance than if you're going off chip. Um, so this memory hierarchy thing, there isn't a, a hard and fast rule, but you can, uh, VTune can show you some incredible counters uh, that can give you an idea of, uh, of where, where work is happening, where stalls are happening, concurrency. This is a view <clears throat> on thread concurrency that shows pretty good concurrency. One of the things it, it would show you is uh, if you got out of balance, uh, you would see that the average concurrency didn't equal the number of worker threads. Uh, the CPU is being pretty well used here. This is a this is a pretty example, pretty good example. So it's boring. I don't know if they're uh, better. Oh, and the memory band bandwidth. Yes, we can show some data about bandwidth. This is a view in VTune of using the bandwidth tool. Uh, and it can show you on the different packages how much bandwidth is being used. The, you, you should have an idea of what, you're, what you expect your bandwidth to be. Again, this is the flashlight thing. It's, if you shine a flashlight and you didn't have any idea what you were going to see, it won't tell you as much as if you had an idea ahead of time. So do a little back of the envelope math. Try to figure out for your algorithm the uh, bandwidth that you were hoping to achieve. Um, and then uh, uh, look and see if the tool verifies that. But it's very hard for me to tell you what to do. Um, 
uh, to increase your bandwidth. Uh, that could be restructuring your code, could be many things, but you should see if it matches what you were trying to code to. An MPI, this is a pretty easy graph to read. Red is bad. I think we accidentally made red good in one of our tools once, and I, I think that was a, a bug fix we asked for, but uh, red should always be bad. So on the MPI trace analyzer, red is bad. It means that the, it, there's a wait happening, and this, this program is pretty, um, this is pretty ugly. Something's going on on the top application. This is probably a reduction, if I had to guess. Uh, operation of some sort, but there's way too much waiting going on. This, this particular beautiful graph uh, looks to me like most of the nodes are running the application about half the time. That's not good. Uh, they're spending half the time doing computation, half the time waiting for some barrier. You can probably do better than that. So this, is, uh, this one looks pretty classic that there's probably some algorithmic shift that can give us a big bang. It's really cool when you see a graph like this and you see that most of the time's being wasted because it tells you that there's a lot of benefit to be had. And again, that's what I, I spend time hunting around in the tools for something this pretty to go after because this says, wow, uh, and this program sucks so much that I'm getting less than half the possible performance. If I can just figure out how to get rid of that barrier uh, or whatever the reduction synchronization is, um, uh, again, this makes me very happy when I find something like this. Now, I can't always solve them without changing the program too much, but uh, this is what you look for. This is funny because this is uh, uh, the gentleman who gave me some of these slides. He, uh, a lot of people think these performance tuners were only for architecture experts or people, and that's how they did start. But really, we're working to try to make uh, these counters more understandable. And there's a few things done. Uh, but we call these performance monitoring counters. So we call them in the PMU, the performance monitoring unit. And uh, th these are present. Most, most CPU vendors have something like this now. Uh, even some of the chipsets for memory have some of these. Some, VTune can look at some of the, sometimes there's chipset Northbridge, Southbridge that have counters in them to tell you I.O. traffic or memory traffic. That's where we can get some of the data, but most of them are still on the CPU. Um, but the raw events can be very difficult to analyze. Um, the reason is, is if you look at a raw event for something like an L1 cache miss, you may miss the fact that um, there's, that sometimes the L1 cache miss is, is serviced away other than an L2 fetch. So uh, an L2 fetch may be a better indication of an L1, what you think is an L1 cache miss than the L1 cache miss. So these get to be kind of complicated because you get down in the microarchitecture of the machine. What you really want to know on a cache miss is did I have to go fetch it from the next level? And sometimes an L1 cache miss can happen and it doesn't have to fetch from the next level for very strange buffer reasons and so forth, but uh, an L2 cache will happen. So the VTune will expose all the counters on every device that you can run on. So you pick something like a certain version of Haswell. VTune knows exactly what counters there are on that. But we also have more abstract counters that we try to make the same from architecture to architecture. And this is useful. I would, t I would encourage you to look at the more abstract counters that we have uh, that we can preserve from machine to machine rather than uh, doing too deep of a dive on the actual machine. And uh, so there's a lot of, uh, these are some raw events. And let me see if I can find a f yeah, favored ones. Uh, bad speculation. Um, depends on what chip you're on, what that means exactly. But what it means is that the chip went and speculated something. Uh, it was probably a memory fetch. And uh, what do you care if there's a bad speculation? Well, you might be afraid it slowed down the machine, but there's other things you could look at to tell you if you slowed down the machine. So the, if you look at the documentation for VTune, it could be very daunting because there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of counters on each processor. Most of them don't matter. I mean, just they, they're great for me if I'm trying to debug a chip or trying to debug a really detailed problem. But in general, my application stuff can be done at a higher level. So um, the, uh, 
So, so there are some higher level packages to use. I'm trying to think there are names. There's, there's, uh, there is one, although someone was showing me, there's one that tells you about vectorization efficiency or intensity. And, uh, but uh, whoever was showing that to me, it was all zeros, which I think should mean that the program didn't vectorize at all. If it means something else, then there's probably a bug in, the, in VTune. But uh, there are some counters. And vectorization intensity has to do with how many vector instructions are issued compared to regular instructions. It gives you an idea if you've, you've vectorized your code. Seeing a zero gives you a hint that something went wrong. Between all the switches you threw on the compiler, all the pragmas you put in, all of that stuff, something went wrong and you didn't get your vectorization. Again, that's a good example of confirming what you thought was going to happen. You worked on your program, you vectorized it, the compiler told you it vectorized, but when you run it, if Intune tells you that it isn't running any vector instructions, you might want to double check that. Um, but if those things are important to you, but you, you probably will notice that with performance, but not always. In a big application, you don't always see the effects directly, and these tools can tell you directly if the pieces of your application are really working the way you wanted them to. This, this um, regression, so regressions, uh, this is an interesting thing. VTune can be run in command line mode, and you can dump out results. And if you have a regression suite, like, you might be able to do a baseline. You might be able to even put this in your make file, have it make and build, and when you run the program, have it store some performance data from your program. And the next time you run it, have it check. It's not that hard to do. And give you a warning if you build the program and suddenly the performance changes a lot or track it. Um, I have a lot of customers that do this sort of thing in production because they're worried about people checking in code that suddenly <clears throat> deteriorates the uh, performance of their application. And imagine an, uh, you know, a photo editing application, a major photo editing application, for instance, with lots of filters. Uh, you might be worried that a filter might suddenly stop working as well, but you might not catch that fast enough. You want to catch it at development time. So let me see. There are a lot of different switches on a compiler. I'm sorry, I think a lot of you know many of these, but let me kind of go through them, see if any are surprises. There are different optimization levels on a compiler, and that may seem mysterious, but O2 is usually, on Intel it's default. I think most compilers kind of have settled on O2 because O0 means don't optimize. O1 means optimize a little. Goodness only knows why. No, they're, often O1 means optimize for space, although we actually allow you to specify that separately in our compiler. But traditionally, often O1 meant use some optimizations, but not if they make my program a lot bigger. And O2 usually meant turn things loose. O3, uh, if it exists in compilers, it does in ours, often says do more optimizations. That usually makes your compile time run lo longer for optimizations that aren't usually as profitable. Um, so a lot of people just use O2. You might try different O flags and see if they help. In general, I'd say if, if O3 doesn't help a lot, stick with O2. Uh, but uh, O2 is by far the most used optimization flag on the Intel compiler. It's the default, um, and that means it's the most debugged. But uh, I have good faith in the other ones. It's just that O3 doesn't tend to be used a lot. Um, it does higher level memory optimizations. Uh, vectorization, there's a lot of different switches. One of the favorites for a lot of people is minus X host. It just means look at the machine I'm running on, <laughs> compiling on, and do the vectorization for this machine. Um, if you have a, uh, if you're compiling on a different machine than you're going to run on, you may want to put a different uh, flag in. Um, but the X host is popular. Um, there is uh, inner procedural optimizations. This is where you give the compiler some hints to look between functions. Um, normally, a compiler only fu compiles one function at a time. If you turn on IPO, the compiler will look between functions, and this is when it might inline one function into another. Uh, and then the question becomes, how many functions can the compiler see? Well, in most compilers, it's how many ever function, or uh, files, how many ever files you put on the command line. Most of us do a make file one at a time, <clears throat> 
uh, one file at a time. So we'll do an ICC on foo.c and produce foo.o, and we'll do another one on bar.c and produce bar.o. Um, if you use IPO in that circumstance, it'll do optimizations between all the functions in that file. Uh, if you specify multiple files on the line, it'll do it between all the functions in all the files. Um, and there is a way to, do I, to have it do IPO in a delayed fashion where you do it one file at a time, but it doesn't really compile it. It puts all the stuff in the .o file, and when you run the linker, uh, it actually finishes compiling and does it between the modules. So you can read up more on inner procedural optimizations. Um, sometimes, you, especially if you have small functions that are being called many, many times, uh, getting them inline and so forth can be valuable. And the compiler is capable of that. The problem is the compiler um, usually only sees one uh, function at a time unless you tell it to look at more. And that's really about the efficiency of the compiler, speed of the compiler. The more you tell it to do, the slower the compiler is going to get. So uh, the reason those aren't default. There is a profile guided optimization. This is not rocket science. The compiler makes, the compiler is a whole bunch of heuristics guessing what the best optimizations are. The compiler uh, writers would love to know how your program's really going to run. So profile guided optimization is um, when you, uh, you actually compile the program with a ge profile gen turned on, you run the program, it produces some files, output files, you feed them back into the compiler when you compile it, and it'll adjust the heuristics on the compiler to match the way your program behaved when you ran it. In practice, what does this do? It fixes, it branch mispredicts, and a few other things. It, it rearranges functions that are called from each other to be close to each other to reduce TLB misses and so forth. Uh, it moves some data, global data structures around. In HPC, HPC programs, eh, profile-guided optimizations don't tend to help a lot. They tend to help with programs that don't have just a few hotspots but are very flat. But we're getting into more people doing HPC work where things are getting flatter and flatter. The classic cases for profile-guided optimizations are databases. Uh, things like Oracle and MySQL and things like that have been, are very flat, but rearranging functions and stuff and doing better branch prediction can be really helpful. HPC programs usually aren't very hard to predict. They have nice loops. They loop most of the time. They only occasionally fall out of the bottom of the loop, things like that. But if you have a program that's a little bit more odd, that might be worth looking at. Most HPC users should ignore profile-guided optimizations. But fast, there's all sorts of different things to run a little faster and looser with math. And if you don't know about these, you probably should. So the first most evil thing to most of us is denormalized numbers. So the default on the Intel compiler is to flush to zero. It's a fancy way of saying, um, when my numbers get so small that they're going to go into the IEEE denormalized format, just flush them to zero. Because denormalized numbers uh, run slower um, on most processors. In fact, I think all processors. But, um, and so you can get really small numbers, and they will suddenly slow your program down. By default, our compiler compiles to flush to zero so that you don't have this problem. But the other thing is there, there are some uh, mathematical algorithms that can be sped up to be more approximate, not quite bit to, uh, to every bit. And the fast option uh, reduces the precision of divides and square roots. Well, I think just maybe just divides. Um, but they're worth looking at if, you, um, if you're doing a lot of floating point computations, especially things like divides, you may want to uh, you may be able to relax it a little. The problem with relaxing is you're going to get a little bit different results. If you're doing testing, that may or may not be a problem. I think that's a pretty good place to stop and take some questions. I think uh, there's a, I just encourage you to take a look at uh, the multitude of um, uh, tools that can give you insights into what your program's really doing. That's ultimately what, uh, if, I, if I had the ability to go on for a couple more days of teaching, I would simply be trying to uh, 
uh, encourage you to use tools like this to look, to have an idea what you're looking for so you can be confirming something, and then um, an opportunity to be surprised, and then follow up on the surprises. You probably won't discover penicillin, but you might discover something equally useful to you. Okay, so um, if, I'm, if I'm doing some uh, performance counters, like what's the difference between using B2 versus using something like Poppy or Tau? Like, yeah, so as, as long as you're using the same counters, there, there shouldn't be any difference. Uh, v, VTune uh, generally has more counters in it. It's kept more up to date than I see Poppy being. There, there isn't a fundamental reason that has to be. It just is. Um, the uh, VTune has um, more of these higher level counters, aggregate counters, you know, different things in its user interface like that. Uh, but like on uh, like the latest Intel processors, like Poppy usually has the uh, issues of overcounts for like full endpoint operations. So, are, do similar issues arise for uh, VTune? Well, it depends on the source of them. There are some things that VTune does to understand. Like it, it, VTune has the ability to do exact counters, and to um, I think we've got better support for the uh, we call them precise counters, but. Uh, uh, and the stall accounting. I'm not sure Poppy does that right, but um, the overcounting, sometimes some of our processors, the, the counters are um, approximate. They may not be perfect. And so in some of our processors, there'll be errata and things are counted. So there, it's, it depends, but there definitely can be times where Poppy and VTune will give the same uh, slightly wrong or totally wrong answer depending on the hardware you're running on. Um, and unfortunately, that's a a quirk uh, that neither can get over. If the hardware is reporting, you know, uh, has a reason to report a quirky number. Um, but I think VTune's just a more rich environment. There isn't a generic, if, if Poppy has the feature, it should work as what, you know, the same as VTune. It's just VTune's a little bit more rich environment. And I know Poppy doesn't, we, we have the things called uncore events, things that are more on the chipsets or memory counters and stuff, and Poppy doesn't understand those uh, yet, is my understanding, so. Uh, my question is about the IPO uh, flag for the compilation. So we have an application code which links to an open source library. Do we, do we need to use the same IPO flag when we compile the, the library? So the question is about using the IPO uh, flag on some parts of your application and not on others. Uh, you might be compiling some with GCC, some with Intel. I, IPO, uh, IPO will only have an effect on the modules that Intel is compiling or that are compiled, but it does, it, there aren't any bad effects if you use it on some and not others. So you might use IPO on a few modules and not on others, and maybe you're linking it with GCC. There's no bad effects. Uh, maybe missed op optimization opportunities, but nothing bad will happen. But, but we've got some error message when we did that. And, uh, and Google cannot tell, tell us what kind of error it is. <laughs> OK, I think you may want to send me more details, and I'll help you get an answer. Uh, but it, the way it's de architected, it, it shouldn't cause an issue to have some IPO and some not. Um. And in, in general, it's probably a good idea to try, when you're pulling in any other libraries, to try compiling them with the Intel compiler, if possible, so that you can also tell uh, what's happening and if you're getting improvements. So if you're, if you're borrowing libraries like you should be, uh, right. try different compilers on them. Absolutely. Keeping it flexible to go from compiler to compiler. And, and one last thing. I mean, you can always send me email. I'm kind of a slow way to get support. Um, I'd encourage you, don't be shy about going to the, the forums on the web or if you have access to Premier support from Intel. We take it very seriously trying to answer all the questions. So give us the opportunity, at least ask the question and uh, get our attention because we want to, to help uh, find everything. Uh, you know, sometimes there are bugs. We, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> everybody makes mistakes. We like to hear that, and we also like to help you if, if it's something we can help that wasn't clear enough from uh, using our tool. Mm -hmm.